theories in here that we need to see whether or not we've got a basis to put this with those that are noted in here. If I could ask you to look into those. Um, big question, Tom, is um, you know, this, this would be a, a piece of our compliance program. That is, we go out and do routine compliance inspections. Um, it does a number of things. Um, it provides dialogue, two way dialogue with a licensee to answer questions. Um, it gives us the ability to address immediate issues if there are any. Um, and typically it's just um, generally to make sure that they're complying with the law in a very generic um, sense. But a lot of this kind of stuff is, it, it, it's more than just surface compliance kinds of things, at least from our standpoint. Uh, the expectation then would be who would be enforcing these kind of things and to what extent, I mean, we don't certainly have training. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, kind of just to balance this, uh, here's the food regs for state of Colorado, um, and here's the three pages, or two and a half pages of sanitary regs. We really, this is obviously a whole different sort of program, much more technically oriented. Um, so we tried to really sort out the sort of key important stuff um, that should be dealt with, you know, well constructed, proper plumbing, decent water supply, those kind of things that are more or less cut and dry compared to what we deal with in other forms. Um, but certainly, you know, the, we need to make sure your staff are comfortable in dealing with what's on the books for you. Is there training that we and our staff could get? Yeah, I think on an for, for these items it's pretty straightforward stuff that we could certainly work with you on. Maybe you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jessica, do you have a comment? Um, I'm reading through both of these and it looks mostly pretty reasonable and good to me. The only thing I'm not seeing is that it seems like it's constantly kind of talking about what MITS shall have to do, but it doesn't really address that the centers who are selling refrigerated and frozen products have to keep those things at certain temperatures um, that are food safe and the food safe handling by the end sailor because uh, no matter how clean I keep my kitchen, if somebody's selling product of mine that's spoiled or if they're storing stuff in a wine cooler instead of a refrigerator because it looks nicer and was cheaper to buy, which is a problem I had with a client at one point, that that's not going to be, you know, the ideal. And so there have to be standards that are held for the end sailor of the product as well as the place where it's manufactured. Okay. Yeah, that that's a huge additional challenge to try and work in here. Um, a lot of the food rag is based on temperatures, mm -hmm. temperature control for either hot holding or cold holding of foods. And once you open sort of that next piece to that, it gets much more complex. You have holding times, you have all sorts of things that we thought probably were outside of the scope of sanitary requirements. But, and Anne? Yeah. I would absolutely agree with Tom. That's one of the things we talked about during the legislative session is, is I think there's a reason why you know, legislative scheme, these products aren't referred to as food, and then you take a whole new set of regulations out of our uh, food, uh, food area. But, uh, we were not intending in any way, shape, or form to impose upon the American Marijuana Program. So I would strongly caution going anywhere near um, food temperature requirements or holding temperature requirements for any of these products in regulation. Now, how would you feel if I have that in my contract to my end user saying you have to store my products at this temperature or you can't sell them? Absolutely. Because my my concern is not what you think. My concern right. is the patient who buys my product with my picture on the label that that I don't want them to get anything spoiled. I mean, I, I want it to be safe. And once One you get into that level of regulation, then your inspectors are going to have to train in those areas. One of the things we talked about a little bit was that certainly we wouldn't want to see anything in these regulations that prevent someone from doing above and beyond what the regulation requires in terms of food temperature holdings and or product temperature holdings, things like that. Um, so again, this is a minimum, like many businesses, you can choose to go above and beyond. And so is it, Tom, is it then meant to apply to the, the MIPS facilities? It, we we focused it on, on MIPS, but it, you know, I don't know that it wouldn't apply to anyone else. We just, that was our mindset. Is there any reason why we wouldn't want a similar standard in the centers? I think we should. No, probably not. Mm -hmm. But, that right. And may I? We reviewed uh, the state, um, that 61 page document, as well as Denver's. Uh, and Denver requires, um, under their, and I have a copy of this, in their 
that this is the approved licensing inspecting of medical marijuana food operations, and they specifically uh, state that food must be stored in commercial equipment that will hold the product below 41 degrees Fahrenheit or above 135. So Denver has gone rather more into depth in regulating um, dispensaries uh, and, and storage of, of uh, or edible infused products. Um, there are a number of questions this raises. One is, does this trump the state regulation that presumably would be promulgated through this? Uh, is this an optional thing? Um, uh, Denver clearly says no, you have to do this. So uh, it raises issues around local um, compliance, local regulations going above and beyond the state uh, mandated uh, standards. And um, some of this isn't bad, actually, but it goes to Jessica's question there about you, know, you want your store, your product stored at a given temperature, and Denver seems to require that. Well, and typically, um, just with the construction of law, they can be more restrictive. They just can't be less. And so, if, you know, if a local government wanted to do something, you know, that that's okay. That's part of their, their thing. Um, yeah. I would also note that um, the statutory mandate only authorizes me to establish these standards for centers and the mix if it's not allowing me to do it, but it grows, mm -hmm. unless I can find other statutory authority for it, so much to do. Right. That does raise What I kind of see here is that it's not if this only addresses the MIPS, and all the MIPS are clean as a bean, and it doesn't address the centers, even for non-refrigerated products, there are food safe handling for cookies, for hard candies. Those things still need to be stored in a secure, <coughs> dry place, away from pests, away from rodents. And there's no point in being you know, intensive on the MIPS if you're not going to hold the centers to keeping those things at the same cleanliness. So to my no, mind, I, see, I, think I see this as uniform. Yeah. I think the, the piece of statute that we were building off of was focused on the MIPS, but um, if there's other statutory authority to deal with the other stuff, that's fine. And a quick reference on the Denver thing. Denver operates under a different set of food regs than the rest of the state of Colorado, so they often do things different from the rest of the state of Colorado, um, and they actually have a, an out from the food regs that allows them to do that, or allowed them to do that previously. Whether that stands, I don't know. Yeah, and again, they'll, they'll have to meet the minimum standards that right. we set for out of this work group. Um, but if they want to do additional kinds of things, that's, that's, that's their, their option. Yeah. Uh, and the question comes up, just to follow up, is from what you said, is it is it good for us to consider the fact of taking Denver's standards and perhaps looking at them and applying some of what they say to a general consensus whereby we could incorporate them? In, into this to cover what Jessica has to say and also what the centers are, are doing. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to take a look at what Denver's done. Um, I, I candidly am more sensitive to the collective group of local health department than a single one. Um, and there's good and bad in each. Um, right, and I agree with you. I'm just yeah. saying, <laughs> for more information of saying, does this make sense in the greater good? Sure. That's the first, yeah. that's, that's the question. And the other question came up, Regarding the waste issue on in D, are there requirements in place that litter and waste are properly removed in the operating systems for waste disposal? You see that up, up top? Because that came under our purvey. We, we were looking at waste situation regarding when we were doing labeling. Right. So is, is there stuff in place that, that we can go to? I think this was focusing on regular trash and refuse, not on um, product. product that's waste. Thank you. And the other thing is the toxic uh, cleaning compounds, sanitizing agents, are they already identified as well? Right, so if you look at the top gray block um, the, on the first page, there's actually yes. a reference to EPA approved mm -hmm. sanitizers. Oh, okay. That's the sort of list, if you will, and again, it's a standard outside of our state. It's national. Easy, easy to apply, easy to reference. Because I'm just gearing toward everything, trying to find the standardization right. and make it relatively simple for the committee and what we can bring to the committee and write down and say, okay, this is in place, this is saying we don't have to, you know, reinvent the wheel here. Right. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> Brian, uh, jumping back a bit to Denver's 